Welcome to the fifth grade online Bible study. I'm Mr. David. You don't have to be a fifth grader to join in. Everybody's welcome. I would like to wish everyone who is watching a happy Mother's Day. Let's bow for a moment of prayer before we get started. Father in heaven, thank you for today and for your faithful provision in our lives. Thank you for family and thank you for moms. Thank you for all of their hard work. Please bless them with your strength to meet their challenges and tasks and give them your wisdom and love to nurture us. Thank you for all those who are in the role of moms and parents, grandparents, school teachers, big brothers and sisters, church family, and mentors. Father, I ask that each of us would look to you for guidance. I pray for those who are single parents. Please comfort and strengthen them. Lead them through those silent struggles others may never know about. Please comfort children and students who don't have moms or stable and loving homes. Protect their hearts from the lies and the schemes of the evil one. Surround them with followers of Christ and remind them that they are not alone. God, thank you for your promises and your word and for your love for us. Please help each of us to make you most important in our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I was growing up, my mom was the greatest. She taught me all kinds of things. She taught me how to balance my checkbook. She taught me about tithing, saving, and living on the money that I make. She taught me tips on reading directions so I could feed myself. She taught me how to add new ingredients. And before I knew it, I was a master chef. Well, okay, maybe not master. All right, definitely not a chef. Spaghetti does sound good for tonight. Now, out of all the things that mom taught me, I don't ever remember her saying anything about the weird cosmic oddities about socks. No, I'm serious. These things are weird. Okay, so you're doing laundry and you're being very careful not to wash red things with white things so you won't have pink underwear, just like mom taught you, and you get to the bottom of the basket and you have one sock. You look everywhere, high, low, and even places that don't even make sense. And you're left holding one sock. It's like they can teleport in and out of our dimension at will. I mean, where do they go? And when you finally give up and move on with your life, there it is, like nothing ever happened. In mom's defense, I suppose she felt like she didn't have to mention it because it's a well-known fact you can drive down the street and see someone's left shoe lying on the side of the curb. What's up with that? I mean, did their mother tell them to tie their shoes and they didn't listen? So they trip and fall in a wormhole, leaving their left shoe as a monument to their epic bad day? I can tell by some of your virtual faces that I should probably move on to the lesson. If you see a sock that looks like this one lying next to you while you're watching this video, it's probably mine. Anyway, we're starting a new unit. We have a new key passage and a new big picture question. Let's get started. Our key passage is John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our big picture question is, what makes people special? People are special because we are made in God's image. He created us as male and female, and he also created us to know him. In our last Bible event, Jesus called his disciples. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20 says this, 
As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 42. Then they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them with one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently, and he came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching, and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. These miracles strengthened people's faith and met their needs. Through Jesus, God did what was impossible for us to do on our own. He provided forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. In Mark chapter 1, verse 22, it says the people were amazed at Jesus and his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God was silent for 400 years. No prophets came bringing messages from God. This left the scribes and the rabbis to figure out the meaning of God's laws on their own. As you might imagine, after 400 years of trying to figure out things on their own, these men were more than a little off track by the time Jesus showed up. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus states everything that is wrong with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I won't bore you with the details, but what Jesus had to say wasn't pretty. Wrong ways of thinking crept in, and man-made rules were added, and they were passed from one generation to the next generation. So when Jesus spoke, he didn't repeat these teachings like all the other rabbis did. He taught truth and the true meaning of God's word. He was God's son and had the authority to speak as God would speak. He went on to prove this by performing a miracle. In Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 26, a man possessed by an impure spirit is in the synagogue. 
Mark uses the term impure to mean unclean or evil. In other words, this man was possessed by a demon. Let's pause briefly here because in our culture today, we have books, TV shows, and movies that portray angels, demons, and evil spirits in ways that can give people the impression that spiritual battles are a fantasy or they're no big deal once the story comes to a close, or they can cause extreme cases of fear. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, which is about the armor of God, assures us that temptations and spiritual battles are very real. God's word warns followers of Christ to be alert and ready. Evil can be found anywhere. In these verses, it was found inside of a place of worship, but God's word and the power of Jesus drove it away. If you would like some basics about angels and demons, stay tuned after my closing remarks at the end of this video and look for the title card that says Spiritual Battle 101. Until then, know this, praise God, Jesus is in control, and he shows us his power over death, sin, and evil. In Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 28, Jesus tells the impure spirit to come out of the man. He then goes on to heal Peter's mother-in-law and many others. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 contains our key to spiritual victory, prayer. Jesus got up early and went to a place where he could be alone to pray. Pray, pray, pray. Stop saying you've heard this a million times and do it. Pray, 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 pray. Pray in the morning, pray in the afternoon, pray at night, pray throughout the day. Pray, 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 pray. Just don't bow your head and close your eyes while you're driving. Moving on. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. If you think this whole coronavirus and social distancing thing is really bad, it has nothing on leprosy in the Bible times. Leprosy was a skin disease that was hated and feared. Anyone who had it was forced to leave their home and their family and live away from people. And recovering from this was very rare. One thing I want to note about this situation is that the man who had leprosy believed that Jesus could heal him, but he wasn't sure if Jesus wanted to heal him. Then Jesus did the unexpected. He touched the man. This was forbidden by Jewish law, but Jesus cares more about people than rules. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you've done, if you come to Jesus, he stands ready and willing to give you spiritual healing and restoration. Jesus traveled all over Galilee. He taught in synagogues and told people the good news about God's kingdom. People came to Jesus and he healed them. Large crowds of people followed Jesus around, from Capernaum in Galilee, to Jerusalem, to Judea, and across the Jordan River. How did Jesus' miracles show his care for creation? Jesus' miracles restored parts of creation that were affected by sin coming into the world. He cast out unclean spirits, made sick people well, and healed skin diseases. Later on in his ministry, Jesus also raised people from the dead, gave sight to people who were blind, and ultimately brought the greatest healing, forgiveness of sins, through his death and resurrection. Do we need to see miracles to believe in Jesus? Why or why not? Many people saw Jesus' miracles and believed, but Jesus said those who do not see and still believe are blessed. The Bible tells us everything we need to believe in Jesus. In what ways does God reveal himself today?
God shows us what he is like through the Word, the Bible. The Bible says we can also understand what God is like by looking at his creation. Take a few moments to reflect on some observations you have made about God's creation. How do these observations tell you something about what God is like? If you're watching this video by yourself, think of some things that you have observed. If you're with a group, share some observations which tell you something about what God is like. Every sport you play and every hobby you enjoy can be used to share the love of Jesus. In the Bible, we read that people came to Jesus and he healed them. Jesus heals people today by forgiving their sins and offering eternal life. Our focus on missions will be in Las Vegas, Nevada. There are very few churches there. A man named Hayden Ratner helped start one called Walk Church. Hayden's church hosts an organization called Fellowship of Christian Athletes, or FCA, at a local high school. Hayden knows from personal experience that God can use sports to change lives of young athletes. Press pause and take a few minutes to pray for the people of Las Vegas, Hayden Ratner, and Walk Church, and the high school basketball players that Hayden is sharing the gospel with. All by myself. So, how was San Francisco? Oh, the traffic is brutal this time of day. Woo! I hear you on that one. Hey, Jerry's back. Hey, fellas. How's it going? Huh? Great Scott, Landry. You've completely missed the sock drawer. Ah, sorry, sir. I'll get that fixed right away. That's why I don't take group tours. Yeah, I hear you on that one. Hey, two of us are going to Chick-fil-A. Y'all want anything? Nah, I'm good. Are you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. All right, then. Later, Gator. <laughs> Awfully nice of them to ask. Hooey! Now that's what I call a family reunion. Okay, everybody's tuckered out, so we're heading back to the barn. Y'all have a good night. <laughs> oh, Jerry, you poor dear. Is Gary out gallivanting around the cosmos again? Yep. You know how he is. He's a free spirit. Well, you hang in there. I'm sure he's bound to come back sooner or later. Have yourself a good night. <laughs> Looks like everybody's headed to bed. Jerry, you want anything before we turn in? Yeah, I think I'll just sit here and watch a movie. Have a good evening. Right back at you. Well, I wonder what's on television tonight. Hey, buddy, you know where Reno Avenue is? Sure thing, just head south two streets and there's a stoplight. You can't miss it. Appreciate it. Have a nice life. Hmm, that was weird. Typically, I see those guys laying on the side of the road. Well, hey there, Gary. Didn't expect you back so soon. This week's question is, I know God can perform miracles, but why didn't he give us the ability to perform miracles? We see in many places throughout the Bible where God performed miracles, and he used people to perform these miracles, like Moses, Jesus, his disciples, and the apostles of the early church. So why can't we? The purpose of miracles is to reveal who God is. He performed miracles to reveal that He is real and has plans for us. Jesus performed miracles to show that He was the Son of God. And these miracles were meant to show us that God's words are true. Please remember that the apostles were performing miracles before the Bible was finished being written. During the times of the early churches, people might ask Peter questions like, Who are you? Or why should we trust you? When he performed a miracle, 
they were more likely to pay attention to Peter and listen to what he had to say about the gospel. While I was growing up, there were TV preachers claiming to have healing powers. In return for these miraculous healings, some of them were asking for money. A fair question to ask them is, if you can really heal people, then why aren't you gladly going to hospitals and sending everybody home for free? That's what Jesus was doing in today's Bible event. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 through 25, Jesus made it clear that there will be false messiahs and false prophets, or in other words, false teachers, who will perform signs and wonders, but they are here to trick and mislead us, even mislead Christians if they can. We don't need miraculous signs and wonders these days because the written word of God for us is complete. It contains truth and power, and it's all we need to know who God is and what he has done for us. Now, having said all that, God still does miracles today. He is a miracle-working God who heals and does amazing things in the lives of his people. Most of these miracles we don't notice because we don't take the time to stop and think about the world that God has created. Now here's a question for you. What evidence do you see that is proof that God is at work in the world around us today? Thank you for watching this video. And again, moms, thank you. And thank you to all those people who are in the role of a parent. Legal guardians, grandmas and grandpas, Mr. Moms, everybody. Thank you for all that you do. Stay tuned for Spiritual Battle 101. And to all the fifth graders and their friends, see you around. Take care. Don't forget, fifth graders, you have your own YouTube channel, so spread the word among your friends. Send me a friend request through Facebook. You can follow the link and bookmark the page. And if you have a YouTube or Google account, you can also subscribe to it. And Meadowood Baptist Church holds live streaming services on Facebook, Sundays at 1030 a.m. Welcome to Spiritual Battle 101. Here's how it all began. Quite a few people know Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a brief statement saying that God was the one who created all that is, all that we see, and all that we can't see. According to Job, chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, all the angels were shouting for joy as God created the foundations of the earth. These verses tell us that God first created the place where he lives and all the spiritual beings that we read about in the Bible including those messengers which we call angels. Next, God created the earth. The foundation of the earth mentioned in the book of Job is the celestial ball covered in water and darkness, which is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. After six 24-hour days, God has finished creating all that is. God calls his creation very good. An unknown amount of time passes between Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, but most likely it wasn't very long. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan appears to tempt Adam and Eve with the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Where did Satan come from? Did God create evil? No, he didn't. If God created evil, he wouldn't be a very loving God. And if evil was running around in his creation, then he couldn't truthfully say that his creation was very good. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 11 through 17 and Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 12 teaches us that Satan used to be an angel. And just like God created us, he created angels with emotions and the ability to make their own choices. Satan became filled with pride and wanted to be like God. Other angels followed him, and the result was rebellion and sin. A war occurred in heaven, and one-third of the angels were cast out because of their sin and rebellion. Now their dwelling place is here on earth. Why live here? Why not somewhere else? God created people to have a relationship with him, and Satan wants to destroy that. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28, God commanded that people be the caretakers of the earth. 
When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, sin entered the world. Because each of us is now born with a sin nature, evil can live around us and even in us. Job chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 says that Satan roams the earth. Jesus says in John chapter 10 verse 10, The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So, if you're a follower of Christ, you need to read Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18 and get ready. If you're not a follower of Christ, it is my prayer that you would see that God is real, He loves you, and that He desires to have a relationship with you, both here on earth and for all eternity. I invite you to call our pastor at Meadowood Baptist Church at area code 405-737-7684 and ask him how you can receive God's free gift of forgiveness and eternal life.